Fox News alert, tropical storm Florence is driving inland and sowing destruction in its path. What was once a hurricane a short time ago has already claimed several lives. Good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson. Tonight we've got a lot of news ahead, but we want to start with this storm. We've got a team of reporters spread across the Carolinas right in the middle of this storm. Deadly storm surge and flooding are major concerns right now. We're going to start with Leland Vittert, who's in Moorhead City, North Carolina. Leland, what's it like? Oh, Tucker, it's unbelievable. Still now 24 hours since the really bad stuff started in Moorhead City. You can still at times lean against these gusts of winds. If nothing else, just to demonstrate how long this storm is taking to move on. And it's really an exponential effect of damage between the amount of rain we are seeing, the amount of storm surge we're seeing, and the duration of it that we are seeing. And it's very easy in the first couple of hours of these hurricanes after they pass a little bit to go oh well you don't really see that much destruction it's going to take days before people can get out and survey what's happening there's still a lot of areas that we can't get to as we drove around just a little bit today we saw entire marinas decimated that means people's livelihoods taken away in addition to their homes most likely taken away the boat captains around here won't be able to make a living for a very long time tucker that's a good point it takes a long time even to know what happened leland vitter thank you Move now to Rick Leventhal, who is live for us tonight in Wilmington, North Carolina. Rick. Tucker, we just moved from Riceville Beach. We're on the west side of the Intracoastal in a private community where there are dozens, if not hundreds, of trees that have fallen. One, uh, two of the four fatalities reported so far was a mother uh, and her infant who were killed by a falling tree on their house. Well, there are trees all over this town and this state that are coming down. You can probably see the, the branch right here. Uh, there's some next to us. It's very dark here. The power is still off, so it's difficult to show you. But some of these trees that came down, not this one, but others that we've seen that are blocking the roads here are at least 50 years old. They're, it's not safe to be out here, and we're not going to stay out here for very long because we fully expect more of these trees to come down. But this uh, threat, Tucker, is true across the state. The ground's been saturated. They had record rainfall already this summer and now with all this additional rain up to three inches an hour in some spots it's going to create a lot of hazards for trees and power lines to come down and and authorities are very nervous about people being out on the roads and being victims of, of stuff like this exactly it's cumulative be careful thanks rick we'll go now to one of the largest cities affected in the carolinas fox charlotte's brett baldock is in charlotte for us tonight brett Yeah, we just had one of those outer bay rain bands move through the Charlotte area, but winds have been strong all day. Take a look at this car right here. A tree fell on it earlier this afternoon. Luckily, there were no injuries. The man parked here, unfortunately, because he thought some of the trees were going to fall down and it fell right on his car. We're expecting at least a foot of rain in Charlotte over the next couple of days, which is something that many places places in these areas have not seen before. This is just the start of the storm in Charlotte. We've already had trees down, but officials are expecting even more power outages, trees down and devastating flooding over the weekend. A foot of rain. Unbelievable. Brett Baldeck in Charlotte, North Carolina for us. Thank you. We're going to go down to Steve Harrigan. He is where he was last night in North Topsail Beach. Steve, how is it? Tucker, we had to pull back a little bit from the beach because the water was simply rising too high. For the past 30 hours, it's been raining steadily, more than 20 inches in this area. And moving around on the roads has simply gotten too dicey. Some police over here are blocking that traffic. The wind today was strong enough to cause some serious damage to a lot of houses on the beach. We saw some roofs taken off and some other problems as well. The one thing that's been clear in this storm the message has gotten out to the people of North Carolina. Almost all the homes we saw, even the damaged ones, boarded up, no one inside. And help is coming from around the country, at least 19 different states sending swift boat rescue teams to help people with the flooding ahead. Tucker, back to you. Steve Harrigan, North Topsail Beach. If there's a storm, he's there. I want to go down to our Ellison Barber. She's in Florence, South Carolina, and she joins us live. Ellison, what's it like there? 
Hey, Tucker, so we really weren't feeling any effects of this storm until a few hours ago. You can see the wind and the rain are starting to pick up. The winds, the strongest winds were recorded about an hour away from here, closer to Myrtle Beach near Conway, South Carolina. Experts say wind gusts there hit about 63 miles per hour. But the story here, the story there across the state of Cal South Carolina is not and has not been about the wind. Officials, federal and state officials say their focus is in the is the rainfall and potential flash flooding in South Carolina. There's a lot of concern about the development over the next couple days for river flooding. There's a basin, the PD River Basin. Water flows into that from North Carolina and South Carolina. Officials here in South Carolina say across the state that that basin is one of their highest priorities over the next couple days. The governor is telling everyone whether they're inland or uh, in another part of the state to hunker down, stay put for the next two days because they say this storm is going to be slow and long. They're saying it won't be like Hurricane Hugo. It won't come through here quickly, and they want to make sure people stay put because they're really worried about all the rain and potential flooding. Tucker? I bet they are. Ellison Barber, Florence, South Carolina, thank you very much for that. So Florence and towns like it are on the leading edge of this storm. The question is what's ahead for them? How much water is on the ground right now? And what will that mean for the destruction that this storm can wreak? Chief Meteorologist Rick Reichmuth has been following us since the very beginning, and he joins us now. Rick, what's, what happens next? Uh, it's a really interesting storm. Because it moves so slow, that just makes all these different kinds of impacts uh, come over probably about the next five to six days, maybe even a little bit longer. just want to show you, this is the last 24 hours of the storm. Started there just off of Moorhead City, which, by the way, is almost at... 24 inches of rain officially, which if it gets just over 24, that would be the wettest tropical system North Carolina has ever had, and I guarantee you they'll get far over that. Uh, it has moved about 145 miles is all in this time. We have some flooding going on. Obviously, you're seeing all of the flooding, but these are our only river gauges where we are seeing either moderate or major flooding going on right now. Go to five days from now, Tucker, and take a look at this. We've got river gauges all over the place that are going to be probably at record levels, and that's because of the rain that's about to come and the rain that is going to move in, move off of the mountain areas and inland areas and uh, just all piles up. So we have a very long event here. We probably have rain until Tuesday or Wednesday, and we are going to have those rivers at record levels, in some cases maybe six to seven feet higher than records, and that will stay at that level for probably five to six days. Oof. Harsh. Rick Reichman, thanks a lot for yep. that. We'll continue to update, of course, on the storm all hour and all evening right here on Fox. So stay tuned for that. Well, there's a lot going on in the political world tonight. Democrats so desperate to stop the Brett Kavanaugh confirmation hearings. They're digging into his high school years with anonymous accusations of sexual assault. We'll tell you what they're saying next. This Democrats would like to stop the confirmation of Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh in the worst way, and they're going about it in the worst way. They have produced or talked about the existence of a letter that no civilian has seen from a woman whose identity nobody knows that accuses Kavanaugh of unspecified sexual conduct apparently 35 years ago. We don't know the year. He was in high school at the time. He's denied the allegations to the extent he's even heard them. Democrats passed this letter to the FBI for reasons they've never explained. The FBI said, we're not investigating this. And yet, despite all of that, the transparent attempt to wreck a man's life because he's in the way of their acquisition of power, some Democrats are saying this letter is enough that Kavanaugh ought to withdraw. Chris Hahn is an attorney, a radio host, a former aide to Senator Chuck Schumer. And he joins us tonight. So let's get the facts of this first in line. Why would Senator Feinstein pass this on to the FBI, which is a federal law enforcement agency, which would seem to have no jurisdiction in the state of Maryland 35 years ago? Why the FBI? Well, the FBI does the background checks of all candidates for judicial offices. And I think they needed to put this into his file. Look, she got this letter uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the the person who wrote the letter did not want to come forward, probably wanted to avoid the same fate uh, Anita Hill faced when uh, in 1991 during the Clarence Thomas hearings. And Dianne Feinstein decided not to make this an issue during the confirmation hearings. There have been many Democrats pushing on her uh, since then to make this an issue, and she has refused to do that. I think she's behaved responsibly. If the witness doesn't want to come forward, uh, it's hard for them 
to, uh, to, to have this conversation. That said, uh, I believe that all victims or, or, or people who claim to be victims of, of sexual abuse should be heard. And uh, I know that Ronan Farrow has written about this in the New Yorker wait, but, but, today. Wait, hold on, wait, wait. I'm sure he'll she be investigating want, wait, it. We'll on. see what happens. She, okay, so you just said that Senator Feinstein did the responsible thing. What about the yes. Democrats who pushed her? Anna Eshoo, for example, from California, and the many Democrats who are coming out today saying he'll resign, withdraw right. because of this story about which we know basically nothing. Are they being responsible too? They're being irresponsible, of course, by your definition. Well, Ashu from Ca Ashu from California was the original recipient of the complaint. Uh, the the constituent of of his call, her uh, called the office and and made this complaint. And she forwarded it to uh, to Diane Feinstein. So so here we are, right? Doing the responsible but what thing. Is, wait, wait, hold on. What, what do you mean? It's, what, what do you mean? It's, there. There's nothing responsible about this. You're destroying a man's reputation on the basis of no evidence. Leveling charges against him, he cannot refute. How would you feel if I said, you know what, Chris? I heard from someone, actually a friend of someone else, whose name I will not tell you that you will never know that you did something 35 years ago in high school. I can't tell you the year because I don't know it, but it was a very bad thing, a sexual thing. And I just want to tell your wife and kids about it. What's your response to that? You know, I'm, character I'm, not assassination. A candidate for the, I'm not a I'm not a candidate for the highest judicial post. It doesn't matter. This is a question is. of fairness. So How would you feel if I did more, that to he, you? He deserves a bit more. He deserves a bit more scrutiny, and I do not think that this has been overdone. I do not believe that this has been. This what has not mean? been part it's of the overdone. hearings. It's overdone. It does. Well, but wait a second. It, hold on. I don't believe it, it has. I, I'm and, not. Uh, wait, but hold on. I'm not arguing. Just to be totally clear, I'm not arguing that we shouldn't know all we can about his life. I, I think we should. I'm for transparency. Right. But the Democrats didn't find anything out. They didn't interview this woman. And by the way, if you're going to make a charge against somebody, you have a moral obligation to show your face and make the charge. You can't make an anonymous charge. We shouldn't be complicit in this. Do you want to live in a world, a star chamber world, where somebody, you don't even know who it is, accuses you well, of a sex again, crime that, and look, you can't respond to it? The, like, what is this? Uh, again, again, she didn't bring this up during the hearings. She sent the letter on to the FBI, who is responsible for the background checks and vettings of judges. They have decided not no, to pursue they it. They sent it as I'm a sure criminal referral. Are looking into it. What do you mean and pursue it? You're, you're not making they no decided, offense. You're not making any they sense. Have decided, pursue they have decided it. not to pursue it. What they, does that mean to pursue it? The FBI has said very clearly they're not going to pursue it. Well, they're not okay, pursuing well, then, it. Well, but hold on. I mean, then what, why what, what wait, is she supposed to do? Is she... Is she I'll tell you what she's supposed to do. Under the rug? No, I'll tell you what she's no. She's supposed to find out if it's true, and if it is, make it public. Right. But if she can't determine that it's true, don't impugn a man's reputation with charges of a sex crime. If you don't know that it's true, that's the most reckless thing you can do. I, Why I, doesn't she apologize to him? What the think, hell is going on here? I don't think. I. I don't think that a senator has the resources to investigate something that happened 35 then years ago. Then don't bring ago. it up. And the quite FBI frankly, I'm does, not sure and if they the won't. The FBI does, but. Well, look, well, then we'll, don't bring we'll it up. see what happens. I mean, what but is again, this? Uh, look, okay. she didn't start You don't see it. this as McCarthyism? It came to her from a constituent. It came to her from, no, I don't. I, I, it came to her from a constituent. I think she behaved responsibly here. This was not this part of sick. the hearings. She decided really? to have the hearings. Uh, Senator Feinstein you know what I would do? decided to if, have the if, hearings be based on the law and his interpretation of the law. This and isn't not the law. This, this is story, isn't. Which no. it could have been. You know what I would do? If, so, if I were a senator and there was someone whose politics I hated. If Michael Moore was up for the Supreme Court and I got a letter saying Michael Moore committed a sex crime 35 years ago, you should know about it. I would say, tell me the details, come forward. And if you don't, I'm burning the letter because I don't like Michael Moore. I don't agree with him, but I'm not going to wreck his life on the basis of an anonymous accusation. I, That's totally immoral. I think this is why I, I think this is why Senator Feinstein okay. held on to the letter and did not yeah, make okay. it part so of the So they leaked it just to, just, just, to, just to make sure his kids were ashamed. It's I don't even know the guy. Well, I'm we're upset. not even sure that they, we're you. not even sure that they leaked it. So thank you, Tucker. Yeah. Yeah, we are. Well, the left is making its final pitch to Americans before the midterms. You may have heard this before. Vote for us or else you're a bad person. How'd that work last time? We'll discuss that next. Plus, we'll continue to watch the effect of what was once Hurricane Florence is now a tropical storm, but it's still hurting people and it's still in our country. So, of course, we'll tell you the latest. Stay tuned. Before now it works. How many women died and how many uh, more women were maimed because of unsafe uh, abortion practices? You know, we just can't go back to right. that. But as a deeply religious person, it's also unchristian.
mm -hmm. to me. Jesus said, suffer the little children unto me. He did not say, let the children suffer. And while we're doing the Lord's work by ministering to the needs of God's creation, uh, they are ignoring those needs, which is to dishonor the God who made them. Bible quoters all of a sudden. Meanwhile, Barack Obama, maybe the most morally self-righteous person ever, returned to the campaign trail, his favorite venue, and is back to his favorite hobby, lecturing America on its bigotry. Watch. Politicians try to keep us angry and keep us cynical. And they appeal to our tribal instincts and appeal to fear. And they try to pit one group against the other. And they tell us, oh, order and security will be restored if it weren't for those folks who don't look like us or sound like us or pray like we do. When we don't vote, when we take our basic rights for granted, other voices fill the void. And demagogues get out there and they promise simple fixes to complicated problems. So Obama is condemning demagoguery, huh? That's a little much, given that for years he's been its chief practitioner in this country. The entire premise of Obama's speech, like countless other speeches he has given, is that his opponents are racist and therefore unreasonable and worth ignoring. The idea that if he calls Americans racist enough times, they will obey. That's how he ran the country for eight years. This is not a policy argument he's making. It's a theological one. The question is, as a political matter, does it still work? What if people aren't intimidated by this anymore? What if Obama's no longer a credible moral voice? And by the way, why exactly would he be a credible moral voice? Democrats tried this very same approach in 2016. Vote for us or you're a bad person. How'd that work out for them? People resented it so much that they voted for a former casino owner so they wouldn't have to hear it anymore. Trump may have affairs with porn stars, but at least he doesn't go on about how he's so much better than you. Democrats don't understand this. They'll never understand this because it will never occur to them that they're not better than you. Their belief in their own moral superiority is at the heart of why they're liberals in the first place. But for millions of others, though, normal people, Obama's speeches are simply a reminder of why they voted for Trump. Dan Bongino is a former Secret Service agent and the author of Spygate, the attempted sabotage of Donald J. Trump, and he joins us tonight. Dan, I'm not sure this helps the Democrats. No, it doesn't, Tucker. And this is all when you listen to those uh, those speeches, those absurd speeches, by the way, in the interview with Chelsea Clinton. These are all based on assumptions that the Democrats assume are dispositive and they're not. And it's an assumption I wish Republicans, more of them, would come out and fight on a higher principle. And the assumption is this, that right. government is some kind of a net philanthropic good in your life. Tucker, there's very little evidence that any of that is actually true. So just to be clear what I'm saying, Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, and Chelsea take this faux moral high ground saying we support a bigger government based on the assumption that this is somehow good for you. Outside of the basic roles of the republic, a military and a court system, Tucker, as I said, there's almost no evidence this is true. Look at the places around America, frankly, around the world, where the government's expansive and all-powerful over your life. What do you see? You see despair, you see crime, you see poverty, you see the absence of liberty. Government is not a force for net good in your life. And I wish more Republicans would stop accepting that 30,000 foot argument as, as a dispositive one. So I wonder though, if the country's changed a little bit, Obama's pitch always was the same. Do what I tell you to do or else I'll call you a bad person or else you are a bad person. Yeah. You're a bigot if you don't like Obamacare. They literally told us that. But I wonder if a lot of people have come to the conclusion, like, I don't really care what Obama thinks. I'm not a bad person. You have contempt for me. I don't care. You no longer have power over me. It's certainly how I feel. I wonder if there are others who feel that way. Well, well, Tucker, Barack Obama is very tactical here. And what he's doing is is not it's not right. It's 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 morally wrong, but it's a it's a very slick tactical strategy. Removing people and separating them from their liberty, Tucker, has never been easy throughout human history. And when I say liberty, yeah. I mean real touchable, tangible things. Taking their money, taking their kids' education, their health care away. The way you do that is doing exactly what Barack Obama does. It's not by lobbying on a platform yourself. Hey, give us all your money. Let's expand government. You don't hear Democrats really saying no. and pitching that stuff. What you hear them saying is, don't vote for those guys. They're the racists. They're evil. We're going to protect you against them. 
It's not what we can do for you. It's we'll protect you against those other guys who are really bad. That's the genesis of identity politics in this new post-JFK liberal movement. That party of JFK, those Democrats, that they're long gone. Those are now moderate Republicans. But it's all moral blackmail. Because their pitch really is American history is so disgusting and indefensible that you have no right to disobey us. And like well, uh, that takes our complicity. We have to agree with that for it to work. And I just don't agree with it. Tucker, I think it worked for a while, but I think the the the, the genesis of social media and, and the, the prevalence now of the Internet and alternative stories for, uh, for news and sources for news, uh, you know, they don't have a monopoly, the big three anymore. So that message that we're all evil and we're all bad and, you know, we should absolve ourselves yeah. of sin by voting for Democrats. It's not working anymore because you have other people countering that to average Americans who can read it on their exactly. smartphones right here. And that's why they want to shut down social media. Ah, Dan Bongino. So smart. Always. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And now to another storm, not a metaphorical one, a literal one. Tropical storm Florence in our country. Some of the left are blaming the storm on Donald Trump. Climate change. We're going to talk to an actual meteorologist, not just a cable news yapper, about whether or not that's true. That's next. deep, long-lasting... This is a Fox News alert. Hurricane Florence pummeled the coast, and now Tropical Storm Florence has made it inland. Parts of it are ugly. WTTG's Marina Morocco is live in Jacksonville, North Carolina. Marina, what's it look like there? Hey, Tucker, you can never underestimate these storms, even as a Cat 1. Uh, for now, things are okay. We get one of these feeder bat, uh, bands that come through, and you can feel the wind gusts and the rain, but so far, so good. However, the destruction seems like this probably very similar throughout the state of North Carolina, especially here along the eastern shore. And you can see uh, these gas stations here, especially all these that are made out of aluminum. For the most part, they're probably the ones that have been the worst hit. A lot of structural damage here in North Carolina. And this is just the beginning as this storm continues to pummel the state and sit just above it, moving at only three miles per hour. That death hole has now risen to five. And it's incredible the damage that such a small storm can create. And you'll see throughout the state, uh, no power here. Billboards just like this one as you drive along uh, these major thoroughfares. Now, what's incredible is the infrastructure in counties like where we are here in Jacksonville. Onslow County, there's not a single building in this county that can withstand a Category 4 hurricane. And that is why they asked for those mandatory evacuations so early into the week so that people could get out because there was simply nowhere else to go. And that was probably the best call because with that uh, storm surge, we saw water rise down by the beach up to five feet. And a lot of those homes along the beach and the coastline, they're taking a total beating. Uh, and it'll be incredible to see at daylight just exactly how bad of the damages, Tucker. Yeah, we'll have to wait to know. Marina, thanks a lot for that report. The Washington Post, which used to be just kind of a liberal newspaper and now is just pure propaganda and unreadably stupid, managed to somehow blame the president for Hurricane Florence. They said he was, quote, complicit in the storm because of his positions on climate change. It's a pretty big claim to make is it true we thought we'd talk to an actual meteorologist on the question not just a new york a washington post propagandist dr roy spencer is a meteorologist he's the principal research scientist at the university of alabama in huntsville and he's the author of inevitable disasters why hurricanes cannot be blamed on global warming doctor thank you very much for coming on tonight um, well thanks for I having that, me tucker i know that you acknowledge the earth is getting warmer and there's a debate about why but there's also this second debate that plays out in the popular press about whether the warming trend is causing more severe weather events like hurricanes, is it? Well, it has gotten warmer, as you said. Uh, since the 1950s, there has been a warming trend. But what we haven't seen in terms of any long-term uh, weather measurements is whether there's been any change in severe weather. There hasn't been any increase in hurricanes. Uh, that's on a global basis in the United States. The, uh, the frequency of hits of the United States by major hurricanes has gone down by 50% since the 1930s and 1940s. There's been no increase in droughts, no increase in floods. Tornadoes are down, but still weather varies a lot, especially hurricanes, year to year, decade to decade. So there's a huge amount of variability, okay? Some of them stall, produce a bunch of rain. 
Certainly North Carolina is going to have a major flooding disaster, but this is what Mother Nature does naturally. And if there's a human influence in there, you wouldn't know it because there's so much natural variability. So I'm confused. We, I know that we keep pretty good records on hurricanes going back more than 100 years. So the data are available to anybody with Google. We know whether or not there's been a dramatic increase, and you just stated the numbers for us. So given that there hasn't been, how can people claim there has been and that global warming is to blame? I don't know. Why do people like the Washington Post say such stupid things? Um, it's because the people that are informing us in the media about global warming are people like Al Gore, Bill Nye the science guy, Neil deGrasse Tyson, people that don't know anything about atmospheric science. Uh, you, you just have to look wait, at the wait, history. Wait, I'm sorry, let me, let me just interrupt you. Bill Nye is a science guy, it's in his title, Did, so that, that doesn't mean he knows a lot about atmosp atmospheric science? Uh, well, no, he doesn't. He's, he's not a trained scientist. Uh, I believe he's oh. an engineer of some sort. Plus, he has a widely viewed YouTube video called Climate 101, where he faked an experiment. He put CO2 into a jar and shone a bright light on it and tried to show that it caused the jar to warm up inside because of the extra CO2. But a TV meteorologist, yep. Anthony Watts, cleverly showed that the whole thing was faked. <laughs> It's, it's ridiculous. What? I, you know, and I believed in Bill Nye, the science guy, till tonight. Doctor, thank you. It's nice to have someone who actually knows what he's talking about on the show. I appreciate thank, it. Thank you, Tucker. American immigration levels are the highest they have been in more than a century. One in seven residents was born in a foreign country. The people who run the country want that number to go higher. The population of the country does not. Univision's Enrique Acevedo joins us next to discuss what this means for democracy. Plus, we'll continue to monitor the deadly path and impact of Tropical Storm Florence. Stay tuned. Daily Dollar Deals are here. Immigration levels in the United States continue to reach new highs. A new report by the Center for Immigration Studies estimates that the current immigrant population in America, legal and illegal, now numbers about 44.5 million. That adds up to almost 14% of the entire country. That's the highest percentage since 1910. In other words, the highest percentage that any living American has ever seen. One in seven U.S. residents was born in a foreign country. Well, polls show consistently that Americans are not for this. Most, when asked, want less immigration than we currently have. A century ago, the last time immigration levels were this high, the public felt the same way. The public always feels that way in every country that has mass immigration at these levels. Since we had a strong democracy at the time, the public got its wish. Immigration levels were slashed dramatically, and they stayed low for about half a century. But America, unfortunately, isn't nearly the democracy it once was, so we can't count on the same thing happening this time. In fact, something very different is happening. Economic and cultural elites demand more and more immigration, regardless of what the public says it wants. Just this week in Oregon, for one example, the CEO of Nike, Mark Parker, announced that his company is opposing a proposal to eliminate Oregon's sanctuary city law. If illegal immigrants don't have a right to settle in Oregon, in total defiance of existing U.S. law, Parker says, the state will not be able to attract, quote, diverse talent. Parker knows what's going on. He's a businessman. As long as you fight to drive down wages in the United States and sponsor athletes who protest the flag, the left will give you a pass for running sweatshops overseas, which it does. The public wants its immigration laws enforced. It said so clearly. They elected Donald Trump to do exactly that. But the stranglehold of our elites, a small percentage of our population, is so strong that the opposite has happened since Trump's election. America is closer to having open borders now than ever. Consider this. From October 2016 through September of 2017, more than 94,000 people were caught crossing the U.S.-Mexico border and claimed to be part of a family unit coming from Guatemala, El Salvador, or Honduras. Now, you'd think that illegally entering the United States would be an automatic ticket home and quickly, but you'd be wrong. These people were not sent home. They were allowed to settle in the United States while their cases were resolved, which in practical terms means forever. Of those 94,000 illegal border crossers, only 1,500 have been sent back. In other words, 98% are still here. 
During the same period, 31,000 unaccompanied minors were detained at the border. And again, 98 percent of them are still here, which means that America effectively, no matter what they're telling you, has no borders. This is not a secret. Word has got out to the rest of the world and hundreds of thousands of people are taking advantage of this. This is a crisis. It's one created by years of deliberate neglect by those in power. Instead of acknowledging it, though, the left denies there is a crisis and then works to exacerbate the crisis. Virtually everyone on the left now opposes a wall on the grounds that it would be too effective. Many oppose any sort of border enforcement, too. The New York City Council just endorsed abolishing ICE on the grounds that too many people get deported, when in fact, as you just heard, almost nobody gets deported. It's a lie. It makes you think maybe there's another agenda here, one has, that has nothing to do with what voters want. Enrique Acevedo is an anchor at Univision and a frequent guest on the show. He joins us. Enrique, thanks very much for coming on. Thanks for having me, Tucker. So when I was born in this country, the percentage of people living here who are foreign born was under 5%. It's now about 14%. So that's a threefold increase. That's a huge change, a huge change in less than 50 years. Is the country better or worse for that, would you say? I think the country is better and the economy is better, but still those levels, 14% is actually lower than what we had 60, 70 years ago, even before that, where that's, it was closer that's, to 20%. Wait, wait, so, so I'm, I'm sorry, you're allowed to your opinions, not to your facts. That, that's untrue. And as I just said in the open, that is the, first of all, the largest total number in American history. 14% the, the largest highest, number? No, no, no. The aggregate number, the actual number, the millions of oh. foreign born in this country is the biggest number ever. But the percentage of population is the highest since 1910. So right. that's what, you know, 108 years. So, OK, so you think the country's better for more than tripling the percentage of foreign born in its borders. What would be the limit? How could we get to the best possible country? What's the ideal? What percentage of Americans do you think should be foreign born? So this is the thing. Two thirds of the GDP expansion since 2011 came from immigrants. And this is not me saying it. It's Citigroup, not exactly a bastion of open borders or socialism. Immigration is helping C the largest Citi economy Group in the world. Our economy Citigroup is an advocate get for open borders just for the record just just so you know but okay so so economic growth comes directly from low wage immigration that's your contention that's not what only low wage immigration i think you know what we're seeing in terms of innovation in terms of economic growth in the country not only in sectors like agriculture or construction or the service sector we're seeing this too in places like silicon valley in places where innovation and, and technology are driving yes. the economy and immigrants are becoming a key factor an engine of growth in in those places. So uh, I agree with you, though, that there is a crisis. Wait, but, but hold on. So part of what you said is true. That's absolutely right. A lot of immigrants have been very successful and innovative and impressive, I think, and great people, by the way. Good. And a lot of them are in Silicon Valley. But the overwhelming majority of the people we let in have very limited skills and very low education level and no money. They're the poor of the world. That's the overwhelming majority of the people we let in. Why not decide that we want to let in every software engineer around the world or every physician? or every physicist, what, why in a post-industrial country are we letting in majority people with low skills? Well, because like we've said in the past, like we've discussed in the past, help is wanted in this country. These jobs are being uh, offered to these people. So that's why they're coming to, to, to the U.S. You can build a wall, a beautiful big wall throughout that 2,000 mile border. And then 100 feet after that uh, wall, you'll have a big sign that says help wanted. So people are going to still come and, and, and try to well, do those jobs. Right. No, I know you're, I, making, you're making the case for big business again, that they shouldn't have to pay American level wages. No, no, so big just business. You see small and no, no, well, you, companies hiring these people and, and benefiting right, no, no, from you're, their work, sometimes exploiting their work. Right. No, you're flacking for corporate America. I get it. But let me just get right back to my original question, which was if 14 percent foreign born is good, what's the limit? If we were 90 percent foreign born, there were a much smaller percentage of Americans living here. Would it be even better? So you said in the past that you're against undocumented immigration, but also for limiting legal immigration. And I think that's that's a real issue here. I don't think we should be uh, addressing undocumented immigration from a border enforcement standpoint, only from a border well, enforcement standpoint. No, of course not. Uh, and, you know, you just said that we have a crisis right now and the policies, the current policies, even the Trump administration policies are not working. That's why we should be working on the push factors on the root causes of immigration. But on the other hand, mm. 
you said you want to limit legal immigration. So that's the thing. You don't want people to come here and uh, request asylum legally. You don't want them to come here and, and try to look well, for actually, a job. Well, actually, what I, and what you I don't want, want no, to, no, no, to wait, get hold on. visas or no, anything you're else. You're telling so, me, hold on. Well, so, so you're telling me what I want. Let me tell you what I want because I'm here. I want a democracy where the majority of voters get to decide what their country does. The big policies come from what people who live here want. And every poll of immigration shows Americans think the numbers are too high. But a small number of activists like you, who appear, apparently have all the power, are saying, we don't care what you want. This is what you're getting. That's not democracy, is it? That's, that's a kind of government familiar to, in Latin America, where an oligarchy is in control. Well, what first, am I missing here? For, well, first of all, I don't know exactly what polls you're referring to because all the polls that I've seen actually have the majority of Americans in favor of comprehensive immigration reform against the wall, against massive deportation, against family phrase, separation. So, you but know, they think and, and most the Americans immigration understand levels are the value of immigration, too. Okay, but, they, but shouldn't they be in charge? Look, very simple, I'll end with this. If the sure. majority of Americans think that our immigration levels are too high, and the polls show they do think that, then shouldn't we reduce those levels? To Why what, don't we exactly. follow the to, lead to, of the to, public? To what percentage would you say would be acceptable for, for you and for... I don't know. How about when I was born, America? it was fine. It was, was a nice... It was a better country than it is now in a lot of ways. You think it's not so? just about in, immigration. In what sense was it a better country? What, what metric? It was a more cohesive It was country. a less diverse country? the middle country, class... Maybe? No, it's not about race, actually. The middle class was vibrant when I was born. It's dying now. And that's the difference. It's not about race. Don't make it that way. Anyway, we're well, out of time. Great to see you. Great to see Thanks. you too, Tucker. Bye. Peter Kersnow is a lawyer and serves on the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, and he joins us tonight. Peter, thanks for coming on. If the argument is, and I think the, arg the argument that the left is making is the more foreigners you have living here, the better the country is. What does that say about their view of Americans? Well, one of the principal reasons people come to this country is because of our fidelity to the rule of law. But when we abrogate and derogate the rule of law in the manner in which we've been doing with respect to illegal immigration, that what we're doing is turning our country into the country, the type of country from which they fled. Your previous guest right. talked about the purported benefits to this uncontrollable level of immigration that we currently have. Certain elites may be insulated from some of the deleterious effects, but those effects are profound. We've talked in the past about the increase in crime rates, and they are increasing. At a time when the crime rates were falling, the crime rates among illegal immigrants went up 44 percent. In addition to that, we've got the public fisc. We've got the burden on the Treasury because of this. Infrastructure, educational institutions, hospitals, uh, and so on and so forth are burdened by it. But the most important aspect of it is the preservation of our sovereignty. If we don't have borders, if we don't have the ability to control who comes here, we're no longer a nation. And again, the rule of law is important, and we seem to take a cavalier approach to the protection of the constitutional order that we've, we've got constructed, which makes us unique in terms of history, in terms of our current stature within the, the world. And if we just let that go, simply don't care about our borders, don't care about the level of immigration so that it satisfies the needs and wants of elites and also of certain political imperatives so progressives can have more people who eventually vote for them, we're going to suffer as a result. I don't even know how they would respond to that. I, every time you come on, I always think, I wish we had an open borders person to respond to you, because I don't know what the answer would be. It's, it's such a tight argument. Thank you. Peter Kirstow, it's always great to see you. Thanks, Tucker. Live update on Tropical Storm Florence after the break. Hi, I just wanted to tell you. This is a Fox News alert. Hurricane Florence has been downgraded to a tropical storm, but the threat persists. Fox's Ray Brogan joins us live tonight from Wilmington, North Carolina. Ray, what's it like? Tucker, good evening. You know, the conditions have calmed down here in Wilmington quite a bit. The rain and the wind have slowed down, although just an hour ago was a very different story, and we were getting absolutely pounded by nonstop rains. The thing we're thinking about right now as it goes into the night is the power outages. Across the state, there are 780,000, and Duke Energy says there's a chance it might not come back on for weeks. We, uh, this afternoon, one of the most extraordinary things we saw was when the Cape Fear River overflowed. It hit a new all-time record high of just over 8.2 feet and it's gone back down now and as the winds pick up back up it's gone back down now but there's still potential for flooding tucker 
Thanks a lot, Ray. Ray Bogan for us tonight. Keep watching Fox tonight and throughout the weekend. We have this storm covered all the way up and down the coast. And we will until it ends. That's it for us tonight. Be sure to tune in Monday. We'll delve into the mysterious shutdown of the Sunspot Solar Observatory in New Mexico. Officials just announced that observatory is being closed indefinitely. They won't say why. We'll investigate. See you later.